Welcome to session 10. After a short break, we now return with a very serious topic. This is on the burning times, the witch hunt, the inquisition, and its impact on modern society and how it bleeds into capitalism and roles in society. So to give the context, we will eventually be getting to the burning times or specifically the Inquisition dealing with witches or specifically women in this case, we'll get to that. But first we have to set the context of how all this became possible. And through this, we will come to understand why our system of the modern day looks the way it does and how it's not much different than what we see in the past. And I hope that will become clear throughout. First, I wanna mention a reference that was true of the um, astrology talk, and that is the year zero, as we understand it now, moving into the age of Pisces. Now this is relevant because the age of Pisces is the age of belief. This becomes a very important theme that we should pay attention to. Everything that we're going to see is um, bent on what you believe, not on what you know, not in who you are, but how people understand what you believe. This is gonna be the mark of the whole era, the era that we're still in. Now, the other thing that I need to establish in this background is that in early Christianity, women were an imperative part of its beginning. And what I mean by this is, although it's not mentioned a lot by the uh, theologians, women were the only ones to witness the alleged uh, crucifixion of Christ. They were the ones that came to uh, the disciples and told them what happened. So if this is what you want to believe, then women were imperative into the very story of Christianity to begin with. On top of that, in the early church, women were equally schooled. So this was a counterculturalist movement. So women were a big part of this. And since it was countercultural, being that the general rule of the old world was a sort of misogyny, this was initially their home in Christianity, in this countercultural movement. They would be tasked with missionary work, um, and they didn't need a husband to do so. They could be independent in this way. Now, something that's also not readily mentioned by early Christianity is this relationship with Hypatia of Alexandria and how um, early Christians wanted dominance over the discussions happening in Alexandria. Mind you, you had all of the old pagan beliefs. You had the Canaanites, you had the Egyptians, you had all that smorgasbord of polytheism along with the Jewish. Um, and the Christians were the new rebel rousers and they are the ones that killed uh, one of the most sophisticated and respected women of this ancient era, Hypatia of Alexandria. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it's just to give context. Um, something as well that's a bit of a contradiction when it comes to the early Christian attitudes toward women is this group called the Antiochenes. Then they were up in um, Turkey and they were trying to establish what Christianity believed. And through this, they started, they came to a very misogynistic idea, and that is essentially that um, Adam was born in the image of God, Eve was taken from the rib of Adam, thus Adam, man, is in the image of God, and women are in the image of an image. So in this way, they could uh, canonize or rationalize their lesser attitudes toward women, which would in part be why Hypatia of Alexandria was such a tremendous threat to them 
even though women had an imperative part of this early church. Now, later on, too, as it's appropriating other faiths, we see that the Virgin Mary is worshipped equally to Jesus. Um, this, this was an appropriation of more pagan-centric religions that, that centered around goddesses. And so the Virgin Mary became that kind of substitute in the coercion of that faith. And also Mary Magdalene in this early period was venerated as higher than all of the disciples. Um, and now Mary Magdalene is completely taboo. If you want to look into this early period too, uh, a good name to look into is Macrina the Younger. She actually had a very interesting part in forming the early thought of the Christian faith. Of course, she wouldn't get any credit. Now, when it comes to the word heresy, which we'll be saying a lot in this talk, the word is Greek, heresis, and this word meant a choice. That's all it meant. It just meant choice. As time moves on, we see that this word becomes more associated with dogma. Um, and initially it was a word for those that varied in their dogma. So just slight dissonance from what was the mainstream understanding. However, in time, this word would become more along the lines of an abomination or a fluke, um, a heretic. Similarly, when we hear the word heathen, this just meant uh, dweller of the heath or one who inhabits uncultivated lands. So rural folk. And this just was a general kind of a subtle insult calling somebody uncivilized at first. And just like this, the word pagan, it's late Latin paganus, uh, which is a uh, villager, uh, civilian, non-combatant. Uh, but of course, in time, by the fourth century, which we'll be spending some time on, this came to mean person of non-Christian or non-Jewish faith. Now, the weird one here, and the word that we're going to use a lot too, is witch. And this comes from the Wicca, or the Old English word. So this is why it's weird, is because it's an Old English word. Um, and it was a female magician or a sorceress. And practitioners during this early English Saxon period in the Saxon culture were welcomed practitioners. Women had their own form of magic, and this was a part of their culture. Nothing wrong with this. So there's the context thus far. We're going to skip ahead all the way to the 12th century here. This is when we can start to see what will become the Inquisition. And before we can talk about how and why witches were persecuted, we have to talk about how that structure even came to be to begin with. So in this time, the 12th century, the church has made itself a powerful entity. This is the Holy Roman Empire from the Vatican. The church had an ordination that it was illegal to preach without a permit or a license from the local bishop. We start this inquisition with the people called the Waldisians. They were traveling preachers. They practiced poverty and humility. They didn't want riches. They didn't want power. They were true Christians in a very real sense. And they were the first to be excommunicated or victims of the church. These people would serve as a tremendous embarrassment to preachers and rulers that would live in luxury um, while they uh, chose the more true way that is more true to the philosophy of, of you know, real Christianity. And the other name here is the Cathars. So I mentioned this in the Gnostic talk. Um, they were vocally opposed to the church. They considered the power structure of the church an abomination. It was an incarnation of evil, which we will see that they're very true <laughs> throughout time. Uh, they, the Cathars wouldn't eat meat. They were nonviolent. They were celibate and would swear an oath to God. They were very peaceful people. Now, in response to a missionary be, being murdered in uh, 1208, Pope Innocent III calls for a crusade against heretics. Now, let's back this up a little bit, because what we have to note here right in the beginning 
is you have a power structure, okay? Now, since you have a power structure that serves with money and that serves with influence, the threat is anything that challenges that power. So this response to them seems very reasonable because they're interested not in what Christianity is, but in maintaining the power structure. So the Cathars um, had a very substantial following in Southern France and an army was sent from Northern France to execute all the perfecti. Those are the priests of the Cathars. Um, they weren't hard to find. They would wear black robes and they would essentially be uh, stabbed in the back wherever they were found. All the nobles that allowed for the perfecti were also executed. Um, so from this, Pope Innocent III, and mind you, how ironic is that name, right? Pope Innocent III called together the Fourth Lateral uh, or Laternal uh, Council to change the legislative structure of the empire to better vindicate all of the asserted heretics. So now they're wanting to fight back, basically. They want to um, ensure the survival of the institution. So right here in 1215, with this council, is the beginning of the Inquisition of the Holy Roman Empire. So now all they need to consider somebody a heretic is they need enough belief or evidence to consider a person guilty of heresy. So in 1231, Pope Gregory IX, the successor, calls out for special agents. These would be labeled inquisitors of heretical depravity. This is where the hunting begins. Um, they would move around the European countryside, burning heretics at the stakes. This is where it begins in 1231. Now, one of these early inquisitors is Conrad of Marburg. Um, and he's one of these fanatical early inquisitors, and he informs Pope Gregory of a secret German group known as the Luciferians. This group never existed. Conrad created the idea to impress the Pope and to use it as a means to burn heretics at whim. A theme that we're going to see here is that it's not about that anything's wrong, it's that they had to find something wrong. So thus they need to come up with whatever means they can to find something wrong so it can make it seem as though they are fighting that good fight. Okay, so a traveling preacher would come into town and speak in front of the townspeople. He would preach of the evils of heresy. So mind you, you're just a town, middle of nowhere, and here comes this special guy adorned with all his robes, right? He would speak the evils of heresy and then would issue a period of grace, as it was called, for anyone to come forward and admit their transgression. And with this, they would get a lenient punishment. Um, this grace period would only last a few weeks, and after it was done, for all those that didn't come forward, uh, they deemed this the edict of faith, um, and this is the hunt. Any testimony uh, was given in secret. You wouldn't know who's accusing you. All citizens are, uh, are like um, incentivized to denounce others in their community. They used fear and terror and self-interest to increase these numbers. And much of the time, you wouldn't know who you were accused or who accused you until the day that you were summoned. summoned. So imagine that. Um, the only way that you could get out of it is if you could name your enemies. And if you couldn't name who it was that was accusing you of these things, then you were essentially done with. Um, so that's the kind of schema that they would use. And that's what would kind of move across Europe at this time. It was about heretics in particular. Uh, so it's not just, um, well, we'll get to the more specific creeds that they were hunting, but it was basically anything that didn't go with the mainstream understanding of what Christianity was. So in 1252, Pope Innocent, 
carries on the inquisitions. However, he discovers a much higher rate of confession is obtained if torture is permitted. So at first this wasn't a thing, but then later on it becomes a thing. And what they're seeking always is a confession. They want to, you to confess that you are wrong, yet you are wrong in your belief. Again, that's, that's where it's all at. So this is where we get all of these ingenious torture methods of the Middle Ages. I don't want to go over all of them. And honestly, I, I, I do not care for this topic at all. But this is history. This is, this is true. So hand and leg screws applied slowly. This was very common. The most frequent one, the most popular torture method was the strapado. And this was you being hung by your arms backwards, bound at the wrist, and raised and lowered in a violent jerking fashion by a pulley, basically to the point where you dislocate your arms and onward. The inquisitor would choose the method of torture, but the actual job was undertaken by professionals. The Inquisitor would take notes, however, and waiting for that sweet, sweet confession. Now, this is that age-old case, two things here. Age-old case of uh, implanting the idea into somebody. If you torture them enough, they're going to admit it in thinking that it's going to spare their life. Likewise, you can't just confess, you also have to give names. So this is the way that it would just spread itself out. Again, I want to review, this all started with just the idea of protecting the power structure. And now we're seeing it rip apart communities, all right? So the other thing that I want to note is that it's not surprising that conviction rates were over 90%. Uh, with these methods, they're going to get what they want, whether you like it or not. Um, these inquisitors thought of themselves, this is something else we have to know, they thought of themselves as God's pioneering soldiers, like the front line, they were saving the world from evil. So whatever means that they could use were justified in their mind. You can see the flavor of narcissism that's within this. So again, terrorizing communities, friends and family turning on each other, lying and cheating and undermining each other, so far spread that communities would eventually do it to themselves without the Inquisitor even being there, as we'll see in the, um, in the Salem witch trials later on. This, this, this toxic mentality would catch on to the, the whole European um, system, really. Uh, with some exceptions, but we'll get to that too. So those that would get off easy would wear yellow crosses. This is kind of like the scarlet letter. They would wear yellow crosses and they could not at any time not wear a yellow cross in public. They would label themselves a heretic and they would live in shame. This was getting off easy. Those who would, would uh, admit to their sin of being a heretic, but then get caught later on going back to their old ways, this was execution. So although this is savage, during this time, it's not as savage as it would become. Later, you could hand people off to the secular courts, and they would take you to another city, they would not hear you out, and they would burn you at the stake. This death could take hours, the inquisitors would not be present. And again, you are, this is happening to you by means of professional executioners. If your family was rich or influential enough, they could pay for the kindling at the bottom of the cross to be wet wood, making you die the preferable death of asphyxiation as opposed to burning. So when I say later on, I'll recap on this, but this is the beginnings of capitalism in many ways. You have not only the beginnings of a, of a court system, per se, but you also have um, the hunters, the inquisitors, there's the money there. You have the torturers, there's the money there. You have the executioners, there's the money there. And then anyone who was taken, they would take all of their stuff. There's a lot of money there. 
So this is in the interest of acquiring wealth, um, which we know all too well nowadays. So to push this agenda further, you could be uh, accused of heresy posthumously. So somebody's dead and they're accused of heresy. So they would plummet or pillage your grave. They would dig up the body and add it to the bonfires. And if they could make this happen, then they would confiscate the inheritance, inheritances of such individuals, leaving their widowed wives and their children penniless. This is where the savagery is really at. And it's under the facade of Christianity, but it's nothing more than power. It's power and wealth. So in 1317, the church even begins to, to turn on itself to maintain its own order. So the Franciscans are coming up with their own ideas and their own dogma and their leaders would be gathered up and burned at the stake and the rest would be made to return to the fold. So this wasn't only a means of them projecting themselves outward, but it was also a means of them maintaining their own structure within the church. So even if you were a priest, you weren't safe from this. So by this time, 1317, the Cathars and the Waldesians have been completely eradicated. So mind you too, when we're talking about genocide and the Holocaust later on in history, this is a precursor or a great um, previous reference point to see how such a thing could ever even become possible. Again, with the power structure built up and tremendous wealth to acquire, Instead of dying out, uh, since all of these uh, Cathars and Waldisians are dead, they need a new enemy. And claims of sorcery had already been bubbling up for decades. They'd use this false claim against each other to basically oust people that they didn't like. So, 1326, the church authorizes the Inquisition to go beyond the investigations of heresy and now to seek out people who are practicing witchcraft. The theory of demonology is created, wham bam, and all of a sudden the importance of the Christian Satan is around. Um, this was not important to early canon of Christianity. Satan was a very minor character if you actually read through the Bible. However, they needed to dig into that book and find something so that they could demonize, pun intended. So now all of a sudden in the Christian faith, Satan is bolstered up to become a, a equal adversarial to God for convenient purposes. Now, 1340s, Europe is completely overtaken by the Black Plague. A significant amount of people die, obviously, we've read about this. Um, and who is to blame for the Black Plague? Witches, Jews, and lepers. This is classic, not only gaslighting, but scapegoating. Something happens, and we're not gonna, we're not gonna assume that it's the own sins of the church that brought this upon the world. No, the witches, the Jews, and the lepers. However, it's not fully into the witch craze yet. This is just the beginning. So in the 1380s, and this is important, okay? Um, it will become relevant. It seems like I'm going off on a tangent, but in the 1380s, for a long time, Jews had fled to Spain um, to, to get some measure of safety alongside Muslims and Christians. This was a good place for them to be in Europe. However, with economic distress, these prejudices sprang back up in Spain and anti-Jewish riots led to the burning of synagogues and the massacre of thousands of Jews. The rule is then to leave Spain or convert to Christianity. So many of them stayed in Spain and were labeled conversos. They would thrive in Spain and acquire great wealth because there were no laws inhibiting them from holding certain jobs anymore since they were Christian. However, the aristocracy, specifically King Ferdinand and his advisors, didn't like this at all. And they wanted this wealth. They wanted this power.
power. They viewed their power as enviable or as a threat to their structure. So they reached out to the Holy Roman Inquisition. They said, these Jews act subversively to stray good Christians from their faith. Anti-Semitism. And here is the birth of the Spanish Inquisition. The difference here is that the Spanish Inquisition doesn't answer to the Pope. It answers to the king, and this being Ferdinand. And you can guess what happens to everybody in Spain from here. To bring it back onto the topic, lighting candles on certain days, bathing, washing clothes at certain times, butchering meat, eating meat on a day that was ordained for eating fish, such as Wednesday or Friday, all of this is a means to vindicate you. The only way to get a light penance was to fully confess and name names. Now, when I'm talking about this, is anybody getting a Red Scare vibe? You know, that whole era in U.S. history where everybody was trying to demonize each other as being communists, this kind of mass hysteria, uh, everybody ousting each other type of vibe? History repeats. So all those who fleed from this were deemed guilty, and all those who stayed would be thoroughly guilty. <laughs> oh, man. So here we're starting to get into the witch era, okay? 1430s, Joan of Arc has been well established. She is understood to be a threat to the power of the church because, as previously stated, the church does not like women in power anymore, not since the power structure has come. And for a peasant girl, to have come into such power reeks of a deal with the devil. And after a year of captivity, she signed her confession and was burned at the stake, May 1431. This would be the kind of beginning or the example of what was to come, Joan of Arc. 1450. The Catholic Church announces that witches, this is where it gets so ridiculous, folks, they eat babies, they sell their souls to the devil, and witch hunts begin. So witch hunters, or bishops, would go off of rumors and implant individuals in communities to substantiate their, ac the, uh, their um, accusations. So essentially, anyone who was out of favor with the locals could be subject to heresy. Basically, it's all hearsay. If you implant enough people to say something about somebody that the church doesn't like, they could say it was this person, this person, they only need two people. And this is where we get one of the worst characters of all. His name is Heinrich Kramer. So this guy, before he gets his notoriety, in 1485, he was charged with interrogating women about their sexual activities. He was an inquisitor, and a local uh, bishop ordered him to be removed from Innsbruck. This is where it's taking place. And that all of his prisoners are being released, being that he was sexually obsessive and crazed. This guy is a classic misogynist. And as we can understand it with our terminology nowadays, he is an incel, <laughs> an involuntary celibate. And he is going to take this out on women in the worst way possible. So in 1487, he publishes the Malleus Malficorum, or translation, The Witch's Hammer. This book describes all sorts of vile activities practiced by witches and comes up with creative methods of getting confessions out of them. So this, mind you, this monk was sanctioned by Pope Innocent, another Pope Innocent. This is Pope Innocent VIII. 
This served the purposes of the church very well. Again, they didn't have any more Waldisians. They didn't have any more Cathars. They needed a new way to express their power and to gain riches. This book that he wrote became the best-selling book for two centuries just behind the Bible. This was everywhere. This would, this would be the staple text to terrorize Europe and North America for centuries. And here's the logic. Get ready for this. <laughs> oh my God. Since the end of the world is coming, of course, of course, fear right away. Here are literal quotes. Satan caused a certain unusual heretical perversity to grow up in the land of the Lord, a heresy. I say of sorceresses, since it is not to be designated by a particular genre of which Satan is known to have power. But devils are subservient to certain influences of the stars. So right there, ousting astrologers, ousting any beliefs that pay attention to astrology. Because magicians observe the course of certain stars in order to evoke the devils. Bam. Mind you, too, if you go back to the uh, astrotheology talk, Christianity is rooted in astrotheology. So this is an ultimate contradiction of terms. Another quote. It is a most certain and most Catholic opinion that there are sorcerers and witches who, by the help of the devil, on account of a compact, uh, a contract with which they have entered in with him, are able, since God allows this, to produce real and actual evils and harms which do not render it unlikely that they will bring about visionary and fantastical illusions by some extraordinary and particular means. Now, this sounds a bunch of wordyisms, right? But this is essentially saying that uh, with this quote, that they can claim any things that would vilify the church as fantastical illusions. As, as, as witchcraft. So anything that would question them is, is witchcraft. Perfect, sets itself up real good. Now here's another one. I won't go through too many more of these, I promise. This is just to label, this is to show the misogyny that's present here. When the woman thinks alone, when the woman thinks alone, she thinks only evil. Since they are feebler in mind and body, it is not surprising that they should come under more spells of witchcraft. Our witchcraft comes from carnal lust, which the woman is insatiable. Now, again, he has some real lust issues. This is some crazy projection. Blessed is the man who has a virtuous wife. <laughs> Women are defective in all powers of both soul and body there were claims of them being cannibals and causing male impotence there was even claims that witches could take away male genitalia through witchcraft oh no so <clears throat> in every way he was stacking the cards against women and the church would eat this up because they needed that enemy this isn't to say that there's no history of Christianity uh, wreaking havoc on pagans as they, become, as they would become understood. But this is when it's really taken up gear. So at this time, now I'm going to jump out of this seriousness for a while. We need to pay attention to the roles of women in ancient society here. Women were midwives, women were doctors, women took care of people, they understood the plants. So the role of the maiden, the woman and the crone was something deep knit in the understanding of culture. It was a great honor to be a crone or an old woman. It was a great honor because to live that long 
means that you have uh, gathered a lot of wisdom and that you could pass on a lot of the knowledge of old wives' tales and midwifery and all of these healing aspects of the culture. This is part of the reason why women were vilified. This had, uh, the old culture had a power in women. It had a role where they held power and the church wanted to take that power. Again, that's what it's about. So now the doctors turn into men. Uh, now there are no more midwives because in the Malleus Maleficorum, uh, it was stated that you know the midwives would cause miscarriages. So if a midwife was around when somebody would have a miscarriage, they would be vilified and they would say such egregious things as that they would eat them, right? As I mentioned before, or offer them to the devils. So in no way could somebody escape the verbiage that had been given. It's a complete gaslight. So the tropes of what we understand witches to be or how they've been depicted in, in the last era of, uh, of film and common culture. The tropes are left-handedness. This was used to vilify them. The old Latin word sinista or sinista or sinistra, I think, would later become the word sinister but initially just meant left, like literally the direction of left. This uh, demonization of left-handed people has a history in the understanding of what we could understand now is Reiki. There's a flow when people join hands of a conduit that moves between two people, it forms a circle. But if somebody is left-handed, then the idea is that conduit can't be formed, it's broken. So then in that way, they're vilified. Another trope that could vilify a woman was having birthmarks. These are marks of the devil. We'll go over this more in a bit as how they dealt with this, but you couldn't even have a birthmark, even freckles. The black cat interpretation is actually from much later. This wasn't during this time. And an understanding, I don't know if this is the understanding, but an understanding of this is that this was taken from Celtic mythology, where there was a fairy known as the cat Sith. Uh, this uh, fairy would take the form of a black cat. So since this is associated with the mythology, this would later be appropriated into how the common culture would understand witches. Now, the riding on the broom. This is one understanding, but to take flight on a broom might be a misinterpretation of an old practice. I don't know if this practice is real. This could also be part of the gaslighting, uh, or it could have been a real practice by uh, ceremonial pagans. But these women that lived in the forest uh, would have a, a very strong understanding of hallucinogenic plants and or sacred medicines. I don't even want to call them hallucinogenic. Um, and in order to best uh, make it palpable to you, because some of it you couldn't eat, um, you could powderize it or move it into a paste and then put it on a broomstick and use that to masturbate with as a form of uh, inducing hallucinogenic experiences or visionary experiences, or in other words, to go fly. That takes a new spin on the understanding of riding the broomstick. That's one interpretation. I'm not claiming this is real. The, the green skin, as they would be uh, depicted as, was the rubbing of herbs all over the face. So if there was a certain medicinal property, then to rub the, the, the herbs all over your face might give it a green hue. So this is why we see that. And the big noses, I think, are a Jewish reference. I think it's part of the anti-Semitism that was happening at the same time. Thus why I was mentioning what was happening with the Spanish Inquisition and their own anti-Semitism. So the two go hand in hand here. So 
to get back onto the topic, the Malleus codified the folklore and beliefs that you, uh, well, okay, let me put this a little bit more simply. They pointed to one text, Exodus 22, 18. All it said was, you shall not permit a sorceress to live. This is one of the only references in the whole Bible where you can find sorceress, the term sorceress. In canon Christianity, there are essentially no references to witches. Um, that's a whole nother topic to get into. So, detailed directions were given for examinations when somebody was labeled a heretic. Mind you, we have all sorts of terms here. Transvection, which would be night riding. Metamorphosis, you know, oh, she turned into an animal. Uh, sexual relationships, uh, incubi, succubi, all of this was going around at this time. Something to fear, something to fear. Um, and if anybody even claimed that they saw something of this. Uh, also, I wanna say, if they saw women even gathering or if somebody said that they saw women gathering in the night, immediately suspicious, immediately uh, persecutable. So all aspects of community amongst women that was once in the very culture has been completely decimated. So once somebody was um, accused, once a woman was accused, there would be a physical examination. They would, uh, they would shave you completely, your hair. They would uh, strip you naked so that they could uh, make sure that you don't have any instruments of witchcraft. So last thing they'd want you to do is, you know, uh, make a spell on them. And so they were also searching for those marks on the body that I was talking about. So if they found a birthmark, they could claim that that is the mark of the devil. Um, so not only was it to find ways to vindicate you, but it was also a means to humiliate you, which would assist in them getting the confession. These are not good times. <laughs> and I don't want to bog you guys down with too much of this because um, although it's really heavy, this all has a tremendous moral to it that we should all pay attention to. And we also end on a very good note too. So uh, just bear with me, please. So this is where we start to get, the Malleus Maleficorum is where we get all those, uh, like in Monty Python, where the, the witch, uh, if she could be drowned or burned, then she might be innocent. And if she can't be, then she's guilty and we have to find another way of killing her. But either way, she's dead. So this was just another way to rationalize it so that no matter what, you're getting those numbers up to impress the Pope and to get more money out of the equation. Because again, they could seize all of your assets upon this uh, conviction. So the numbers here uh, of this time period are really difficult to completely discern. A more conservative estimate is that between 1560 and 1800, between 50,000 to 100,000 people were tried for witchcraft across Europe. This number can go all the way up into the millions, but it's questionable because do you really trust the accounts of the inquisitors and wouldn't they want to inflate the numbers more? And also just the general anarchy here, like I said before, um, it wasn't just the inquisitors that were doing this, it was also people doing it to themselves towns doing it to themselves because of the infective mindset that had pervaded the culture. So there really is no uh, quantitative number that we can put to this. Um, you, if you weren't popular, if you did things in ways that people didn't like, if you uh, didn't do the right things on certain days, if you um, even just piss somebody off, this, this could be grounds. So the actual craze wasn't about witches per se. It was this conflated idea of witches. And even if uh, many of these numbers of individuals were practicing ceremonial magic of the ancient traditions, 
this number is not quantifiable in the whole of the number because again, they were going for everybody and they were going for the very role of women in society. Um, so I have to preface this in, or more like uh, break this down in, in a few ways. So it's not all ne the neo-pagans. That was a giant part of it. But if you're a midwife, if you're a native healer, even if you identified these healing aspects with Christianity, no luck. Most of these victims were executed by local and community courts. The church did have a significant margin, but again, a lot of this was happening from people in their own towns. A substantial minority of this time period were males. I would say roughly 25%, but again, numbers here are not very valid. Most of this craze took place in Germany, France, and Switzerland. In Russia, uh, there are only found accounts of about 10 claims of, uh, of uh, executing a witch. In Ireland, there's only four. These things didn't spread as far as one might think. This is very mainland Europe. But of course, as we know, it would have a systemic impact on the culture of Christianity, which we'll talk about, and it would bleed over into North America. So this would continue on and slowly die out over time, but it would have an, an upsurge every once in a while. For instance, the Salem witch trials. So there it's a, it's a story that most people are accustomed with. 200 people accused, 30 found guilty, 14 women and five men were hanged, five people died in jail, and one man was pressed to death for not confessing. You might say that the Salem witch trials in uh, 1692 and 93 was the kind of last hurrah of this, but they continued to persecute women uh, and the occasional men in Connecticut and Massachusetts, 14 uh, women, two men uh, in the 17th century alone and elsewhere. So it kind of had this residual downplaying as Christianity lost its power structure and its hold over the whole of society. So with the rise of, of rationalism, you would see this, this fear mongering and this craze slowly die along with it. Um, however, before I get to the breakdown of most of this, I have to say that the witch trials, persecutions, and executions still do happen today, not in the Western world, but in Cameroon, Gambia, Ghana, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Zambia, Kenya. They, they continue in Asia, in Nepal, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, India. You see it in the Amazonia and Brazil, and you see it in Saudi Arabia. Every single time, no matter where we're talking about, in what time in history, the witch hunt is always predominantly low caste women, poor women. Okay. Now we can start to get to more of the breakdown of all this. That is the historical reference, uh, a big span of time. And of course, there's much more I could go over in that regard. But this is mixed with a few topics. For one, grimoires have been uh, uh, an unmentioned part of this topic. Grimoires, much in the same way as today, uh, young kids want to smoke cigarettes and drink alcohol because it's wrong or it's viewed as illegal. Grimoires were this kind of very expensive sought after book of the, of the uh, Middle Ages and the Victorian times. And most of the time these were acquired by men for the sake of conjuring spirits to find riches. They wanted to find treasures, things that were buried or gold or things like this. This is a big part of not only European, but also North American history of using magic or conjuring or sorcery in order to acquire treasure. That's a whole topic of itself, but it wasn't nearly as vindicated as the witches were because again, this was about women, of, of, of ruining women. And men would more often than not get the yellow crosses or they would be imprisoned. Now, throughout this whole thing that I've talked about, we 
see this element of mass hysteria. This is pumping a people full of fear. And when fear comes about, the worst of the worst can happen. Um, when there is a tremendous amount of fear, people show their true colors. So if you have power hungry, misogynistic, uh, wealth seeking individuals, a, 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 an environment of fear will be their breeding grounds. And this whole thing from the heresy movements of the beginning inquisition to the later on all the way into the Salem witch trials is all about capitalizing on fear. And this is where the, the, uh, the section of, of capitalism comes in. And mind you, the colonial mindset. So we are so right, right? We have the way and we need to make sure everybody does it this way. And this would lead to the colonializing of all of the ancient world, the new world of going all over the place. This, this was born out of this power structure of the church. This culture arised from very small moves time after time that led to an extreme cor corrosive and cancerous attitude. In this too, capitalism, right? The money making, the power of the church and exploiting people of using their fear and death to, to acquire riches this is not something to shy away from. And you mentioned this time period to modern Christians. And of course, there's that kind of wave off, that waving off, you know, don't talk about the Crusades, don't talk about that. It's all about the real deal, you know? And still to this day, there's that rife corruption in the Vatican as it still maintains itself. I'm not even gonna get into that right now, but it's, it's, it's something that we have to really look in the face because, the use of fear in politics is as old as this and older. Uh, what we're experiencing today, what we're experiencing of, of, um, of uh, kind of that vulturous exploitative capitalism can be found in its root in this inquisition. We have to acknowledge why it happens, to what use it happens, and, and acknowledge uh, how it pulls the wool over people's eyes. So this has affected the common culture with the fear of the occult, the fear of palmistry, the fear of tarot, the fear of all magic, associating it with, with spirits and demons and the devil. This happens all across the Western world still in its very subtle form. And what is not paid attention to is that this very fear was born out of a misogynist incel, that this very uh, concept was created to exploit and profiteer off people and to subjugate people to the powers of the church. That this, that these, even if these practices are happening, they're nothing like what people think they are. And they're, they, they think they're, they think that they know so much about these topics without ever looking into it because the Christian mainstream has, has coddled them or propagated or no, 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 propagated them to believe in such a way. So I, I have to speak personally and say that I, I am, um, I do palmistry. I do tarot readings uh, for people in my community. I can't tell you how many times that I've gotten that, scowl from from the old ninny um assuming of uh, uh assuming that she has knowledge over what i'm doing and the whys and the what's uh, uh, thinking that i'm a sort of shyster this still lives this is not done with and like i mentioned before i mean it is elsewhere where it's people are still being executed um okay 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 so the 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 uh positive end of this is that throughout this last century, the fear of the witch has been effectively turned on its head. This happened slowly. So at first it was about kind of quelling or storifying or downpla downplaying the role of the witch. So in the first examples we see like Snow White, we see like the Wizard of Oz. This is that kind of cartoonishness brought to it. It's the first time where it's kind of satirizing itself 
and it's making itself a bit of a cliche. This was a way of transmuting this, this terrible um, propagation. And throughout time, we see that this has been completely turned around, i.e. that we see it in the modern, or like in the 90s with Sabrina the Teenage Witch or in Charmed, where it's a much more nuanced and, and topic of interest, where it's not something to burn somebody at the stake for. And my, my most prideful part of, of talking about this history, or I shouldn't say prideful, but I'm, I'm so, I'm very pleased when I see women have taken this term witch and reappropriated it into a term of strength and female empowerment. And this, this is, this is beautiful because it's, it's hearkening back to the age that was forsaken, uh, to the old role of wisdom in the, uh, the wisdom of women in the, the old empowerment that had been stolen from the culture of women. And, um, even just all the way down to seeing the kind of subservient women of the 1950s as you're supposed to just please your husband and basically be a tool for whatever his patriarchal manly ingeniousness ordains is all been made by that same demonization of women. And to see this form of independence arising again and this remembrance and this experimentation of the divine feminine and green witchcraft and pagan communities and holding ceremonies with um, intentions of, of, of healing, uh, of bringing back the old wives tales of becoming healers and natural paths and running apothecaries and just simply getting that, getting that archetype returning back to that sense of community and camaraderie around women. And it, it was such a long time that we're still healing from not only men enforcing this structure, but women imposing this structure onto one another. It's now only starting to crack in that, that we can start to see the, the, the real healing and the remembrance and the, the solidarity that was once there that, that has been taken away. And the other the other note that I want to make here, it, the big takeaway from all this is that the use of fear by power structure is by no means over. And to be fearful is handing your power over. If nobody plays the game, there's no game to play. If nobody buys into the fear, there's nothing, there's nothing to fear. Uh, if, if a law is made that transgresses on people's rights, if people don't enforce that law, if they don't believe in that law, then it's not a thing. It, this is about personal empowerment. <clears throat> We've had enough examples throughout history of how this fear, power structure, exploitation has wronged the whole of society aside from those who benefit from it. And we are just now coming to a point of recognizing these power structures, the tricks that they have always deployed, fear and all of its forms, and finally reasserting our own internal empowerment. They're not going to empower you. You have to empower yourself. We have to form communities that are stronger than the type of infectious gaslighting that, that we can recognize it when it's happening, now that we even have words for it, mind you, and that we can safely repel that and make that not even possible to enter our situation. So you can see why I wanted to give this talk now, out of all times to give it. Um, ooh, it's a terrible topic, but it's, it's, um, it's one worth learning from and worth acknowledging. And what we see in the modern division of, of racism or, or as it's always been to sexism or as it's always been to anti-Semitism division. 
to give up this control, to not allow it to function, to allow other people to be as themselves, to not need to appropriate them to believe what you believe. This is the remedy for all of society. It needs to happen on the individual basis and then it happens on the collective basis. Okay, with that, I'm gonna close and if anybody wants to stick and ask questions, I'll be here. <laughs>